It is a scam when you don't allow everyone to operate on fair terms. We are the Robin Hoods of sports betting. We take something back from the rich bookies and enable our customers to beat them instead. Hi guys, Alex here. Welcome to episode 26 of the Trade Mate Sports Podcast. Today I am joined by not only a guest, but I'm joined by my co-host, Marius. He's back. It's been a couple of episodes since you've uh, been away, mate, and I won't I won't hand the microphone over to you yet. We're only using my, one microphone over here, so we'll, uh, we'll keep Marius silent for now. But um, the, uh, the most important guest, sorry, Marius, is... Uh, is we are joined by profiler, researcher, and analyst, Mike Holden, or some of you might know him as the man behind Fox Punter. Mike, are you there, mate? Yeah, good, thanks. Good to be here, thanks. Good, mate. Holding up well at the moment? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Weather's picking up in Valencia, so happy about that. Nice, mate. I'm sure you're uh, enjoying the sun, not like us in Oslo, eh? (laughs) Absolutely not, no. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, mate, um, mate, do you want to just kick things off? Tell us a bit about Fox Punter, um, how it came about, and what exactly you guys do. Yeah, well, my my history is in journalism. Uh, I graduated from university in 2005 and started working for Sporting Life website. Uh, went on to work for the Racing Post as well, all as a freelance. Um, also worked for Odds Checker, Betfair, different uh, a, f- a few different companies really. And mostly my content was always preview related content, match previews, and a lot of manager analysis. Um, and then basically in recent years, I've just kind of branched off to do my own thing. You know, the freelance game's not getting any easier. Um, so I just decided to, you know, add sort of a sizable audience, I suppose, through Twitter. Enough people for me to start doing things uh, by myself with my own business. So that's kind of where Fox Punter's taken off. Um, And it originally came out of a rating system that I developed probably about eight years ago now um, that initially had an edge in itself as a rating system. I've just found it a bit more, you know, more and more difficult over time. There's more and more analytics people flooding into the market and, you know, graduating from university and a lot of very clever people out there data scientists and stuff so I'm kind of just I've gravitated away from that now I I had an edge for a while on the analytics side but now I my passion has always been the psychology side of football anyway okay so can you speak about what that was like to move from the data analytics side of things where I mean it must be a hard thing when you found yourself an edge there and then all of a sudden you've lost your edge can you talk us through that process Mm. Yeah, well, basically, it you know, it's one of those things that, like I say, my passion was always psychology, but I, I got as excited as everybody else. When the an- analytics movement came about and you had all these fantastic bloggers giving kind of giving free information away of how to build an XG model and things like that, um, you know, I was, I was at the beginning of that kind of crest of a wave when analytics people started flooding onto Twitter and social media, and I just picked up bits and pieces that I found and thought, right, I've got some ideas how I think this could play out and I'll kind of match, marry my ideas with what the little bits of skills that people are teaching me. And, you know, it was exciting and I found an edge for a while, but when your edge dissipates, you know, you don't see it straight away. So you obviously, you, you, you do well, you win quite a bit of money for a while and then you probably do quite a bit of it back as well in the time that you're finding out that this isn't working anymore the way it was initially. I had a period probably nine to 12 months. I, I, it's, it's hard to say really that there was a really good period of about nine to 12 months. So where I was, you know, winning consistently. Um, and possibly what I didn't do well enough was refine the model continuously. I kind of came at it with the mindset of if something keeps working, stick with it, but you've got to keep evolving. And I probably didn't do that fast enough. But then it, by the same token, didn't have the skills necessarily, for, you know, if more and more expertise is coming into that space and you're not necessarily of that background and maybe you're not going to keep up anyway so so that I guess that's kind of what happened so it was really exciting for a while and then and then it became really challenging for a couple of years maybe trying to decide where I was going to go next and and you know how I was going to approach things because the way that I'd been successful for a short while wasn't going to continue it became quite clear yeah, so what made you want to go from the statistical side of things and then over to the 
psychological side of things? Um, I mean, it's easy in hindsight to look back and 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 kind of write a narrative of if there was a definitive. I think I've just kind of gradually phased back, it, you know, back into that side of things because it is more where my natural sort of skill set lies anyway, or my, my natural interests. So, you know, the rating system I've got now is still, to all intents and purposes, a break-even system. Um, and so it's a foundation for everything that I do now. So I wouldn't say it became it went from this brilliant winning system to suddenly a massive losing system. It's just you know I was putting a lot of time and energy into something that wasn't making you know wasn't clearly making money of its own right. So gradually, as it's a break even system, the longer it becomes, it is a break even system. You're thinking right, well, how can I provide the edge on top of the foundation that these numbers are giving me? And that's basically the journey I've been on for the past three or four years, I suppose. You know the first. I guess you, you have this edge, you make this money for the first year, 12, you know, 12 months or so. Then you're kind of using it to, you know, I, I was working as a consultant for a, one of the major bookmakers in the UK at once. They wanted to see the ratings, they wanted to see what it was doing because they knew it's past performance. So they wanted to see, right, okay, this is something that we can maybe incorporate into what we're doing and see if it, you know, it correlates with our own work in, in setting prices and things like that. Uh, and then all of us, and then you know, you're you basically opening it up wider and wider as time goes by because you know you're aware there's other models out there, and you know you're aware that so so you just start sharing it more and more. Also looking for feedback from from people that you know subscribers and people that you're coming into contact with. Um, so it, it's been a continual. It's not been a like you know one day I was I was all about the stats and the scientific side, and then the, you know a year later a transition. It, it's kind of been a gradual process, but I'm definitely more into the psychology and artist back into it now. That was always what originally was anyway in the sort of in the 2000s. With regards to the psychology, what sort of level is it on? Is it on a player level, like looking at this guy's on like a gold roth right now? Or is it at team level, like this team is really motivated because they're playing their uh, local rivals? Or is it at like a market level where you're looking at um, Pantus? underrate uh, the unders for example okay yeah um it's an interesting question actually because there's probably been different phases um at the very beginning as a punter when i first started embracing psychology it would have been on the level of motivation what motivates teams not necessarily distinguishing one team from another just you know team loses a derby game one week is the reaction the following week because you know uh, and and it kind of gets more and more sophisticated the longer you do it. You know, you're trying to look into different perspectives. So, you know, you take that example. To take the very first example, you know, that I probably ever had was, the, you know, a, a very basic level. Motivation is about carrot and stick. And, you know, you you have a manager comes out after a defeat and absolutely berates his players in the media, comes out, does the angry thing. Um, and then you expect a reaction the following week. I mean, that's probably the most basic thing, you know, I'm probably going back 20 years when I was looking through newspapers to see which managers had lost the plot on the last performance and then think, right, let's track their next game and see if he gets the reaction he wanted. Then it becomes more and more sophisticated. So then you're looking for different scenarios. Like I say, derby games might be one that's a particular trigger point. Certainly the further down the leagues you go, you know, to lose to your local rivals if you're a League Two side's a big deal. You know, it's it's not something that the fans get over lightly because you're going to finish mid-table in League Two and then two games against your local rivals are really important. And especially if you let yourself down with your performance, don't just lose the game but don't turn up either. So it, it just gets more and more sophisticated the more you go. Um, so it would start, for me, it started on a level of scenario, those kinds of scenarios, but Gradually over time, I've become. I, I've always been fascinated by managers and their leadership styles. So, I would begin to distinguish that this isn't just all teams that do this in all situations. Some managers will get a reaction out of a team better than others, and some managers will take the softly, softly approach and the carrot approach rather than the stick, and that's when they get the reactions, and so on. And then you just begin to pay a lot of attention to just the managers manager does this the reaction is this kind of chain of thought and and just build up more more and more sophistication to it so 
now I'm at a level where I've come to manage your profiling because you just, you know, as you as you increase your understanding over time, you know, you're looking for more and more nuance to what it is that you're doing, and that's what Myers Briggs as a typology system has brought for me in recent years, and that that's that's it's given me a framework that I already had kind of a vague framework in my own head of, of the way I thought things worked. And then all of a sudden, you know, I read up on this this framework that already exists in Jungian psychology and thinking, hang on, there's so much of what I do here is just, can, you can just kind of plug it in and go with it or in Myers-Briggs terms. So that was, that was where the fascination came about. And I've just probably about four or five years ago discovered it on a level that, was kind of enjoyed reading about you know reading about it the last two years it's gone to a different level because I've gone to the US doing courses and uh, gone through a certification process to learn how to profile people in you know in like an interview context and how to passively profile people who you're not in the room with who you can watch a video of someone and try and work out their personality type so it, I've gone really really deep on it and I'm only going deeper during lockdown with the the pandemic, so yeah, it's 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 exciting. It's just what what has always fascinated me. So you got a Myers Briggs uh, sort of profile for every single manager, then? I'm getting there. Yeah, um, I I I kind of passively passively profiled managers for the past twelve eighteen months anyway, but now the past four five you know, how long have we been in lockdown since the middle of March, so two months. Um, I've basically been transcribing, I've got a big database, I keep managers interviews, every weekend all the managers across England, across the four divisions, I'll record the audio interviews off whether it's on the YouTube channel of the club page or the official website or the the uh, local BBC radio stations and things like that, I'll go and track down these manager interviews, I'll record them and keep them all on file so I've got like two seasons worth now of manager interviews. And the past two months, I've basically just gone through transcribing interviews because I've realised that it's one thing thinking what you see, in a, you know, or here in a, whether it's an audio or a video, it's one thing. Your your first impressions is one thing, but when you actually see the concrete words down on the page, then you begin to see the the actual function speaking of you know what what's probably going on in their mind as they're saying those words, and sometimes. You know the the way they come across. They can be quite. You know, you can. People's words can belie the the image that they're trying to portray and stuff like that. So I'm beginning to see those kinds of nuances now. So I'm really enjoying that. I'm a bit curious to hear. Then, have you noticed anything with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer? Because when he was coming in, I remember some of the first interviews he did for Manchester United, and he was like super happy, super positive, and everything. But as like the weeks and months have gone by, he just seems to be almost a bit more depressed as, as things have gone on. So I don't know if you've noticed anything with him. Yeah, I think the first thing I noticed with with Solskjaer was that he. I mean, I wonder at what stage I'm going too technical here. I'll try and unpack before I start getting technical. But he came in, he leads with the process that I call nickname Harmony, technically called Extroverted Feeling. And it's about the group dynamic. It's about the culture of the club and stuff like that. And he was so obvious when he came in. He's trying to revive the spirit of Ferguson in pretty much everything that he's doing. And he's, you know, he's, uh, it was it was almost as if he was trying to turn the clock back in 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 what he was doing and the way he was going about things um and yeah so that was immediately noticeable i've never gone i've not gone too deep on solskjaer just yet i'm not i'm not i'm still in the efl on the transcription side of things uh i'll be going into the premier league soon particularly if it starts up again in the in the coming weeks um but i i believe i've got his type down and yeah, he's been he's been an interesting case, and I, I my attitude towards Solskjaer has changed as well. I'm I'm a Manchester City fan, by the way, so you know yeah. I was quick to ridicule and to laugh when he came. You know, as if he, his his track record wasn't the best when he comes in. He's obviously if he'd never played for Manchester United, he never would have got the job. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, so when he first came in, I thought I, I thought it was quite funny, and I just thought you know this is doomed to failure and so on and so forth. But I think as the time goes on, I think it's clear to see that he's doing a job and possibly just a, an interim job almost, an extended interim job where he's basically building the foundations, you know, for he's, 
he's building back up the culture of the club slowly over time. If you you know his last couple of transfer windows have actually been, you know, compared to the likes of buying Pogba and players who whose you know mentality is questionable and whether the heart's really in it. He's buying young, hungry players that he can sell the identity to a lot better. And at, at least now you can see some direction with it. And even though it's not, you know, I don't think United have particularly turned a big corner on the pitch in terms of on a tactical level and in terms of, you know, they've got this way of playing against the big teams where they can sit back. You know, they've done it to, they've done it to City three times this season. They've sat back, they've picked us off and exposed some of our current weaknesses in a way that you know you might have thought would happen once but to happen three times would suggest that you know there is there is something to what he's doing when United are allowed to play as underdogs and allowed to play as a team on the back foot but I don't necessarily think they're evolving tactically he's just building the culture of a club that if say in a year or so it was to hand over to someone else and I wouldn't be surprised if Solskjaer was the kind of manager that would take a step back and think, okay, yeah, let this next guy in now because I've taken this as far as I can, then I can kind of see where United are going now and it looks like they're at least working to a plan which they were just going for big names for a few years after Ferguson. Yeah, so before we go into like how you implement all this manager profiling into betting, can you kind of go through just the exact process that you, you said you've started in the EFL in terms of your manager profile? Um, can you give us an example of a manager in the EFL, um, just picking one out out of nowhere, and then how do you start the manager profile and the process you go through there? So you want to know my process, not necessarily the model. Yeah, I mean I can do both, but my process at the moment is I'm probably best I'm probably best starting with the model to be honest. There's 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 eight different cognitive functions. I think people who've got any familiarity with Myers Briggs probably know it through business and. There's like these 16 different personality types that are four letters and it's you kind of get a vague profile at the end of it that's very generic. You know, it's putting 7 billion people into one of 16 boxes and saying you're like this, you're like that. That's that's at a very sort of generic level. Um, but w behind it all is like eight functions, uh, eight cognitive functions or mental processes. Four of them are ways that we learn and the way that we take in information and four of them are ways that we make decisions and, and you know the conclusions that we come to based on the information that we've got. Um, so these that means there's eight different functions, four learning styles, four decision-making styles, and we will each have four of those processes. So we'll have two learning styles and two decision-making styles. One will be a strength of each and one will be a weakness of each. So... There's a thing in in basically on the course that I studied is a there's a model known as the car model. And if you kind of imagine your mind as a car with four passengers, you've got a driver, a co-pilot, a ten year old, and a three year old. And these are like f the four different functions, four different parts of your brain. Um, and the driver is like an effortless flow state. The co-pilot is like a, also a strength, and if it will be the opposite of the driver. So if your driver's a learning style. Your co-pilot will be a decision-making style, and when you work with those two functions together, you're at your best. But then there's these two children in the back, which are the opposites. So we, we we've kind of all got everything. We're all we've all got an extrovert side. We've all got an introvert side. We've all got a way to think and deal with logic. We've all got a way to feel and deal with emotions. We've all got a way to deal with concrete information. We, we've all got a capacity to pattern recognise. But for some of us, some, th some of those things will be strengths and for, for others, you know, some of those things will be weaknesses and we've all got this little dynamic going on and once you begin to understand them fun functions, you can start to understand behaviours. So basically what I will do is I will just, when I take a manager and look through his interview, I will just look for comments, remarks or behaviours that reflect one of the eight functions. And the ones you begin to see come up more prominently because because we all have a little bit of everything, but the ones that we're good at and the ones that we enjoy using, um, we basically use more often than the ones we don't. And that's why they get stronger and stronger because you know your weaknesses are known as the cost of specialization. If, if you've got two opposite ways of doing something, whether it's logic and emotion, if you're strong on the logic, you're going to keep using the logic, which only makes you get weaker and weaker on the emotion. But 
you know, so you, you begin to see what comes out most often when a manager's talking. Um, so that's the starting point. It's just to begin. You know, is he talking about when when a manager's summarising a game? Is he talk? Is he talking a logical way? Is he talking about the actual football and the game itself, or is he talking about the players and that what what the game has been like as an experience for his players? Is he talking emotionally? So if he's talking more emotion and more, you know, you, you, if he's talking more emotion than more logic, you think right. Well, he's a feeling manager, not a thinking manager. He's, you know, he's going to have an F in his, you know, he's, he's, and then you then you begin to work out which one's the driver, which one's effortless, and which one he's actually deliberately trying to work things out in the interview as he's talking. Is he, you know, is he is he talking in the world of conclusions, or is he talking in the world as if like, you know. I'm still processing this now in the interview, even though the game's finished. I'm still trying to work out what was going on myself. So you just got all these kind of different patterns to recognise, and it, it's. I mean, I've been I've been looking at this for th- four years now, two years very intensively, and even six months ago, you know, I look back at stuff I did six months ago, and think I was so wrong there when I was, you know. So it's not something that is. You know, you don't just pick it up and within six months, you, it, it's a lifelong skill. And the the people that have come across that know it best, you can tell it's a lifelong skill and not just something that you, you pick up, right, I know that now, let's move on. So, yeah, that's kind of the process I'm going through at the moment with, with manager interviews. Okay, mate, it sounds very, very in-depth, mate. I feel like you can go down lots of avenues with it. It's very interesting. Um, so how does this... How do you implement this embedding? I don't know if you have done this so far, but how do you get, I'm, I'm just trying to think of an example off the top of my head, like how do you, say you've got a manager, you profiled him over however long, and you, you in your head you think you've profiled him into this category, so let's just say maybe he, you think he's a an emotional manager, let's just say. I mean, there's probably something more deep that you can categorize this person into, but let's just say he's something like an emotional manager. How do you then take that manager and implement it into the betting market. Well, this is going to be kind of the. Ne- it has been the last this season so far. I have been on a very surface level trying to find these patterns and make sense of these patterns. Um, and I've got some theories um, that at this stage I need to get to the bottom off because you know if I've got a huge edge then I don't want to be sharing it all out straight away but <laughs> I mean it's some basics of um, you know if it, if if an emotional manager is, you know is put in certain situations you know it it depends it depends what they're dealing with if they're dealing with a emotional manager you know might struggle with logistical problems whether that's you know a lot of matches in a short space of time or whether it's uh you know um pressure coming from outside from you know supporters and and some managers are more sensitive than others to even social media you know you go into the lower divisions league one and league two uh, i'm trying to think of an example that i can pull out that's just kind of quite recent and fresh in my memory i know one manager in particular like john mcgreal at colchester has always been very sensitive to what's being said on social media, what's being said on local radio stations in the phone-ins and stuff like that. And quite regularly, he'll refer to it in his interviews that, you know, outside of Colchester, nobody really knows what's been going on at Colchester that week in the lead up to the game. But to him, it's this big deal that, you know, it's been part of our team talk, what's being said in the past seven days. And you're thinking of a, you know, you, in my head, I'm thinking he's he's probably just talking about a radio station that's just had a couple of hundred viewers, like a couple of hundred listeners on a Tuesday night to a phone in, and he's taking this stuff really seriously, and he's using it in his team talks and things like that. So, I guess that's one example of how an emotion, a more emotional type manager might, you know, react to things. So, we, if that's the case with Colchester, I guess you want to be keeping abreast of what's being said locally. That matters more than a club where the manager's a logical manager who's just watered off a duck's back when the fans are, you know, disapproving or whatever in, in those circles. Do you think that one type of manager is better than others, like logical versus emotional, for example, or is there no, like, right answer there? And no, I wouldn't say so. I and And this is the temptation at the beginning, is to think that, 
what I've found is that basically the managers that we like and we generally think, oh, he's a great manager compared to the, the person next to us, you're probably picking a manager that is very similar to your personality type because you, you like their methods, because you like the way they think and the way they do things, because it's the same as the way you think and do things. You know, uh, you know, I, I can just pick out an example. That a friend of mine who's a United fan could never believe that we got rid of Roberto Mancini, but he's the same personality type as Roberto Mancini. And, you know, he was, you know, that, that's been the big thing of him. The only manager I've ever known him say that he's liked as a city manager or that he admired as a city manager was Roberto Mancini. And it was purely because it's the same personality type. And, you know, we know that and I've explained it to him now. And he's like, you know, he doesn't, he's not buying any of this stuff anyway, but you know, so it's like, it, it, it's, we, we do tend to gravitate towards our own personalities and like managers, but I think it's important. And I think that's one of the big things I've learned is learn to appreciate managers who would, who have got completely different skills that I never used to appreciate, you know, and, and the, the thing, managers, certain managers used to get my back up, you know, I didn't like the way that they carried on in the media. And now that I understand where they're coming from, I think one of the main things to understand with a system like this is that everybody's behavior makes sense to themselves. And once you understand in what way somebody behaves and it makes sense to them, then you can start to, you know, you kind of coming from a place of appreciation rather than just, oh, I can't stand that guy, he, he does my head in, you know? So you just having an attitude of, I can't stand that guy, he does my head in, he's not going to win your money betting on football. Having an appreciation of appreciation of what he does well and what he, what his weaknesses are at the same time and, and, and knowing the weaknesses of the managers you like, well, I, I think that's a lot better place as a punter to be able to, you know, call things better is if you've got that kind of two sides to every manager and you 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 know you see both sides of them yeah i think it's um it's it's one one question that i do have for you is someone i was talking on the podcast about this months ago when premier league was on was um the difference in the i guess the worries that i had for as an arsenal fan the worries i had about liverpool and the longevity that their success could like the longevity of how long they're um, their success would go for because I see Jurgen Klopp as someone who's almost their best mate all their players like he, he treats them all like their friends and I think if you're looking at that managerial style compared to like maybe a, a Jose Mourinho or a, even maybe a Pep Guardiola like that more harsher like kind of style where they're really like striving to get everything out of the players every week not that Jurgen Klopp doesn't but it seems like Jurgen Klopp's style I'm thinking off the top of my head that his style would be it worries me because I feel like he could get this out of Liverpool for years and years and years um what would you say about that um I think there's there's it can go one or two like you know there's no sort of one this it, this isn't only going to go one way um but you know you talk about what he did at Bruce Dortmund it's very similar you know he is a he leads with an emotional function, Jurgen Klopp. He rallies everybody together. That's what he's all about. You know, he's got this one way of playing, uh, this one style of football that is reinforced, and 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 the style of football itself feeds into the emotion. You know, it's about pinning yeah. teams back and suffocating them, and the you know the all the emotion and all the history of Liverpool and the the, the media help they get and the 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 cop playing into the cop and those kind of things you know you're not just playing against Liverpool Klopp's creating this impression that you're playing against this, this weight of history you're playing against this you know you've seen the teams that are crumbling in the Champions League now it's somewhat similar to Borussia Dortmund though and it kind of reached a point where one day it just suddenly stopped working and nobody could fathom what had gone on in that season you know and it was almost you know I think everything or anything can have a shelf life and when it you know something that is so incessant and so Klopp as a character is so relentless and it's so emotional that you know potentially there's some fatigue that goes with that that you don't notice in the moment when you're winning things but then when it stops and you just suddenly take a breath and all this hits you that you know you, it's you know like getting back on a treadmill I suppose after you've stopped it's yeah. just 
you can it, that season at Borussia Dortmund it was just like they had nothing left to give and nobody could understand why something that had worked so well for so many years just suddenly completely broke and that's that would be the precedent I'd look to with Liverpool not necessarily in the next 12 months next two years but when it ends I wouldn't be surprised if that's the way it ended for Klopp again Lovely, mate. I love hearing that from you. Thank you very much. It gives me a bit of hope as an Arsenal fan. And and on the on the subject of Arsenal, I'd love to just selfishly uh, get some views of what you thought about what you've thought about Mike Mikel Arteta's start to his tenure at Arsenal, because it's uh, from it's probably similar to what you're saying about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, but Ole Gunnar Solskjaer before. Um, it seems like his first uh, approach to coming to Arsenal was kind of bringing everyone back together. Um. I think there's an element of that in a lot of managers when they first take over. I'll be honest, I don't know Arteta's personality type yet. and I've, I think he's an intuitive manager and I think he's a, a logical thinking manager. I think that's... I mean, you can be too anecdotal sometimes and it's tenuous to say the fact he got on so well with Guardiola means that he's similar to Guardiola. But I don't think it... You know, it, It's not going to be a surprise if he's a very similar type of personality type to Guardiola. Um, I don't actually know his personality type yet. My first impressions, though, is that the first thing he did when he went in that I noticed was that he went back to process and he was very much about keeping it simple for the players. It was about ball retention. You know, I, I, from what I gather, the, some of the very first training sessions were all about ball retention and making that this is our number one priority right now. It's about we're starting on a new process and it's going to take time. But I just kind of want you to get back on the ball and enjoy having the ball, and and you know, and you get them first few performances when he goes in where the Arsenal players seem to be enjoying themselves, and then it kind of breaks down a little bit a few games later because it's not that simple that you just go in and start passing the ball around and everything suddenly falls into place. I think Arteta's got a lot of work to do, um, but yeah, his impact's been good because I think. In Unai Emery, they had a manager that was very results-focused and very outcome-driven. So I think he'd make a lot of compromises. If things aren't going well, he'll make short-term compromises to try and get a result tomorrow. But long-term, it, it kind of undermines the work he's trying to do. Or that, you know, it's it's you're not reinforcing anything over over time. You're just trying to get the next result, trying to get the next result. So the more, the more you get stretched, and especially when you're playing Europa League football and things like that, the more you get stretched with your resources, the more compromises you make, the more compromises you make, the more you get stretched and so on. So I mm. think they've gone back. I think It feels like they've gone back to basics a little bit with Arteta. But like I say, I don't know his personality type yet. So I, I wouldn't begin to predict in what ways he might be going about it. Yeah, and back to betting, mate. Do you think when you do... I mean, you said you've done a little bit of betting, but do you think... Do you think your strategy will be more focused towards week-to-week stuff and little things that you're picking up from managers? Or do you think that it will be mostly like future-driven focus? Like, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is like, when do you think a manager will get sacked? Um, I'm trying to think of some other future manager kind of bets or who's going to be the next... I mean, that's not really who's going to be the next manager of Liverpool or something like that. That's not really probably something you're looking into either but um, yeah do you think it'll be more week to week focused or future driven uh, probably week to week focused I don't uh, anti post markets are a difficult one at the moment I do enjoy playing anti post markets and I do enjoy you know getting big prices early in the season about a team that's not necessarily started well but you know have got or you know you believe they've got the tools and the right manager in place at the right time and in the right cycle that this could just be a blip the first seven or eight results and that they've got they can be the real deal so I do like that side of things but I guess I've kind of been playing Asian handicaps the last few years and it you know it's it's you know you can get bigger bets on and stuff like that and you can be more com you know you can be more you have to have a more conviction in the way you go about it so Probably more on a match-to-match -match basis is how I'll use it. My initial... The first thing you tend to do, or the first thing I've tended to do, is is, is try to recognise when you think a manager's under stress because he's not behaving as himself and you begin, you're begin seeing he's beginning to feel the pressure. Um, and, 
yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say I've had a huge success with that just yet. In like, I, I'm always confident when a manager. There's not too many dismissals anymore that shock me. It's the timing that usually shocks me. I usually, you know, sometimes I sense a manager's reached the end of the road um, several weeks before he actually goes, but then turning that into profit necessarily is not, you know, because sometimes just persevering, if a, if a team's been on a bad run and a manager's come under pressure and you just think he's at the end of the road with this with this team and with this this group, it's one thing saying, you know, you can go wading in against that team the following week, but, you know, the market's probably against them anyway because results haven't necessarily been good. So it, 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 there's a balance there of what's your unique information that the that the market doesn't have. And that's, that's what I'm, you know, in the process of trying to find out now that what's different to what the market already knows. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've had... It's, it's tough to say because the season hadn't even played out to a completion. So I'm kind of in the stage where I'm thinking, you know, this has not been a great season so far and I normally do well in February and March. But then the, the kind of some of the conditions in January and February is a lot of wind matches played in wind in February more so than usual, which was just, you know, February is normally a really good month for me, but wind's just a complete leveller sometimes. And then March, you've got the coronavirus and how that's just completely disrupted things. So I... Uh, I've not even got a full picture of how this season was playing out yet. Um, I've just got a clearer knowledge of what I'm looking for without necessarily having tested it to my, my own satisfaction yet. Yeah. Okay. And do you think do you think the bookies are doing this, mate? Do you think they've gotten to this level of research yet uh, in terms of psychology and stuff like that? Do you, I mean, I could assume that they factor into their odds. The fact to say Mikel Arteta got sacked this week, Arsenal got a new manager. I assume they're going to factor that into their odds. But in terms of like press conferences and you know maybe little things that you're picking up on, do you think they're you know compiling odds based on that? I don't at all know, and I don't think the market is. I don't think the, the biggest syndicates in the world are, are necessarily doing it. I'm seeing no evidence of it. You know, I. Um, I mean, obviously they keep they keep their secrets to themselves, so you'll never know for sure but I um I, I think it's I, I have spoken to a few people who who are part of syndicates who you know uh, you know run syndicates and things like that and I know putting the feelers out on that I don't think many people I think psychology is probably the next big frontier that you know because there's so much sophistication around data analysis now that the next big job is okay how can we look into psychology and which is why I've been ad attracted to it myself and why I'm so drawn to it because I, I I do think it will be you know the next cycle we've been so data heavy for the past 10 years or so, well last six or seven years but more and more so as each year progresses that I think the cycle will turn again and, and there'll be new methods come and, and this could be one and this is kind of why I, I want to be right at the forefront of it yeah, I mean, if it if it does turn, mate, I'm sure you will be. It's been a couple of years that you've been looking into it now. Have you thought about how you, when you come up with maybe some sort of model or you've profiled a certain manager, how you then convert your feeling? So you say you've put Mikel Arteta into some sort of category and then you've seen him exude some sort of emotion throughout the week in a press conference. How you then say, okay, well, I'd actually think that Mikel Arteta is going to get his troops firing this weekend how do you then compute that to a value bet and finding like if the odds are doing what you want it to do so there's actual value there mm. well no that's that's the next step I am working with someone on this at the moment uh, very early days though so I don't really know I haven't really got answers to those kinds of questions myself yet uh, it's just you know just hypothesis testing different scenarios different managers in different scenarios and 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 seeing uh, i'm told basically i i, I want to stay away from the statistical side of it because i don't want my own biases to come into the hypothesis i come up with but you know um i trust the guy that i'm working with and so i'm leaving that side entirely to him and i'm getting good positive early signs to be honest that some of the things i've mentioned 
the initial n- numbers look very good. So, but it's very early days. You know, you can't get too carried away off. You know, a, a couple of hypotheses and and you know, it, it, a long way away from turning that into anything yet. But yeah, it's exciting. And have you thought about replicating this across any other sports, mate, outside of outside of football? I don't know if you're a fan or you follow many other sports. I I think there is potential, huge potential in other sports, and this comes down to personality. The problem for me is it doesn't suit my personality type to spread myself thin uh, across. Me, you know, I'm an introvert. Introverted intuitions, my like my my driver state I like to go deep on one particular subject and go deeper and deeper and deeper all the time uh, I'll have to... I love how you profiled yourself mate <laughs> say again sorry <laughs> I love how you profiled yourself well it's one of the first things you have to do I think is understand your own weaknesses <laughs> when it comes to betting but yeah so it's yeah it's I think individual sports especially I mean you think of, uh, snooker for example you think a snooker's all mental and you know if you're playing you you get a night's sleep and you straight you know you're from a quarter final into a semi final into a final and all you've got is a night's sleep between it and you're stewing on whatever you're stewing on between days and between sessions you know i would imagine the potential there's huge i don't know how big snooker markets are and what size bets you can get on say it goes for tennis golf things like that i just mm. think there's huge potential for it but I'm not necessarily the guy for it, but yeah, if anyone wants to make me an offer, I'll franchise the the model out and see what they can do with it. But yeah, yeah no, you, just you you would think that more like less physical sports, I guess, where it's de- like more playing on emotion. Like off the top of my head, I'm thinking darts, uh, golf, like you said, like those more um, yeah, where it's just most of it's just based on emotion rather than if your legs are sore or if you're tired or stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I could definitely see how you could get an even bigger edge in sports like that. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, it's some, it, it's one of the first things that came to mind, but then I asked myself the question and I just thought, you'll end up dropping the ball with the football if you start trying to take on other mm-hmm. things. You know, it's like my depth of knowledge. You see, the thing is as well, there's a lot to say just for, you know, I, I've been studying these managers and their methods for 10 years anyway, so there's a lot of, anecdotal historical sort of examples I can call on because you know even before I understood this model or understood how to profile I've got lots in the memory bank of different types of managers and different types of scenarios you know you type somebody like Neil Warnock who's been on the scene for 20 odd years and you know there's plenty of managers out there who've been around 20 years now and you know their personality type and you've got 20 years worth of information on how they've coped in certain scenarios then you know it's it's not so simple as to turn around and say every manager that's the same type as Warnock will do the same thing as Warnock, but you begin to see patterns and trends of you know how yeah. how managers deal with certain situations. Yep. Yeah, all right. Cool. Uh, Maris is going to leave us now. He's got to uh, get to something more important. How dare he? But uh, it's good to have him back on the podcast. Thank you, Marius. It's been a pleasure to listen to you, Mike, and I very much yeah. to listening. Lovely to meet you, Marius. So very cool. Cool. <laughs> Cool, mate. But we'll uh, we'll continue. Um, let's. I want to try and not move away, but ask if you're trying to replicate this. All these things you're figuring out about managers and how you then, if it's directly related to how you profile a team, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't see things as clubs and seasons. I try not to measure. Um, you know. I try not to measure by team, I try to measure by manager, I try to measure by tenures as opposed to actual seasons. So uh, every anything I look at, any teams in any particular situation, I guess the first two questions I'll probably ask myself are, who's the manager and how long has that manager been in charge? Should he have a handle on this yet or not? Is it unreasonable to expect him to be on top of this situation or not? So I guess that, and, and then... Everything kind of builds out from that context. So, you know, a manager that's... I guess the sweet spot's probably 12 to 18 months. When a manager's had a couple of transfer windows and you're in that 12 to 18 months spell, that's usually... That's when the pressure starts to mount if he's not starting to deliver anything different than the guy before him or, you know. So, 
Um, in the first 12 months, you're always kind of cutting managers a bit of slack. And then once you get past that 18-month stage, you're beginning to look for results on what they've been doing. And if they just seem to be still treading the water and having the same problems that they had in year one, then you're thinking, right, okay, maybe maybe this is, you know, certainly when you're talking anti-post and looking long-term, I wouldn't be... I wouldn't be in a rush to buy a uh, to to back a club to win a title that was say three years down. The, but then it depends on personality type because there are certain personality types that it takes a while. And yeah, this is possible probably after timing. But crew a great example. David Artel uses introverted thinking. Takes a, can take a long time for his ideas to settle with the players and then to really understand exactly what he's asking whereas someone who uses extroverted thinking they are very hands-on on the training ground from day one specific instructions giving players documents this is what i want you to do very specific here's your man this weekend here's his strengths and weaknesses this is what how i want you to play against him you know down to the finest detail match by match by match whereas introverted thinking is more about principles and they kind of wait for things to go wrong before they start correcting problems as they go. So, you know, there's differences there. So there's two thinking styles, but to say that a manager's a logical, tactical thinking type manager and not very personal with the players, it it, it, it goes one of two ways. There's the introverted way and there's the extroverted way. So, it, you know, it, there's, there's so much nuance to it. Yeah, definitely, mate. And if you're looking at say off the top of my head the best example i can come up with is someone like arsenal and no matter what manager they've had and they haven't had too many they've had what three i mean you can't really include freddie lundberg but they've had three over the last five or so years less than that do you or and if you and if you look at arsenal over the last decade you kind of see them as a terrific attacking team but then you go well they're not so great defending and they really do lack a hard edge. Um, Do you think that sort of stuff changes under new managers? Or let's just say six months or 12 months into Mikel Arteta's reign, do you think there was still, even though he might have implemented some sort of, you know, way to get around all those kind of things, do you still think it's still there deep down in that it's like, you know, in the club, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's... This is the balancing act. I'll give you some examples. Like, like, we'll take Arteta as a high, hypothetical scenario going forward. Yep. There's two ways he can deal with things. There's certain problems that he can do himself. If you know his personality type, you know whether he can do that or not. So whether it's working with players' emotions and, you know, it, it depends what his skill set is and what the problem is. Can he solve that problem himself by working with the same players? The other alternative is the transfer market. If he can, then you want to see him address those issues in those in that first and second transfer market in the, the, those windows um, and try to understand why he's doing what he's doing because those particular players wouldn't if he's if he's had six months to try and get a tune out of this player and he's just not it's just not happening and that player goes and people are like oh you know how can I be getting rid of this player but you know that there's a reason probably you know or you, you suspect that that player's problem is not a problem that he's particularly skilled at solving then you can start to make more sense of it because what I would say as well is that there's a club that I've been talking about quite a bit recently in Scunthorpe that has gone through some good managers in the last couple of years and I think once that rot sets in at a certain club they missed out on the playoffs about three years ago in League One and the following season got relegated and something changed after missing out on the playoffs and it was kind of like a rot setting there was a a lot of very experienced players at certain ages contracts running down whatever it might be but you've got a you've got a dressing room full of players who just don't seem to care anymore and two very good managers or two managers who've proven themselves capable at that level in Stuart McCall and Paul Hurst have got in gone in and never really got on top of the job and I think if if bad management over a number of years in terms of recruitment and how much wages you pay players and things like that, a club that goes stale and that goes rotten can spit out very good managers quite easily 
if you know mm. use use Scunthorpe as an example they probably after that playoff campaign needed to get rid of nine or ten players at once but nobody really very few clubs or managers go into a job and get that luxury you have to get two or two rid of two or three in the first window bring two or three in but if those six that are left behind uh, uh, are influencing the, the the mood and the culture more than the two or three you've just brought in you've still got a problem so it's like a you know it, it, it's a situation that 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 never you never get on top of because the only way to get on top of it is to completely wipe out the dressing room completely start again and very few managers ever get that luxury so but that's not to say I, I could have or anybody could have predicted what would happen necessarily to Scunthorpe in that that season when it just suddenly all turned um you know it's each it's, but as you see these things develop and you just think there's a lot of players there on big money that don't Sheffield Wednesday have been a very good example in the last 12 months or so of a club that's teetering on just being absolutely stale there's players there and Gary Monk's gone in and he's tried there, there's a lot of players that are out of contract in the summer and he's just completely bomb, bombed them out into training with the youth players and stuff like that you know they're older guys on big contracts and he's trying to motivate them and realise very early I'm going to really struggle to motivate these guys so he's just completely bombed them out but performances have taken a nosedive and now it's almost like before the lockdown Monk was kind of clinging on by his fingernails to a job that if he can just get to the summer gets rid of those players and gets them out of the building and starts to build then Mm. you know he could do a very very good job next season but you get this situation and this is you know you don't know the dynamics behind the scenes so you can't say for sure exactly how it's going to play out but to you know to know to know some of these things just helpful anyway you know to 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 because Monk could get sacked from that job and then he's on the back of a couple of sackings and he goes into his next job and people think oh well he's not all that he's not done well in his last few jobs and might still be a brilliant manager and if you can make reasons for why in his last two jobs it didn't work out and they're not necessarily problems that were his fault, then you can be straight out on the front foot wanting to get with a club that looks better suited to him and the situation he's walking into. Yeah, and I also I read through your ebook a little bit, mate, and a brilliant ebook, by the way. Just give that a little plug for you. Give, definitely give that a read for, uh, to everyone who's listening. Um, you mentioned in your ebook about predicting teams that are unmotivated and teams that are motivated can you kind of just give us a quick example of how you know maybe how you could predict a team is un or how you can see that a team is unmotivated at the moment Mm. Ian Holloway is a good example at the moment he's gone in at Grimsby and he's probably a good manager for a club like Grimsby that's kind of wants to be put on the map and that's pretty much the attitude that Holloway's gone in with. He wants to put Grimsby back on the map as he wants to make, you know, um, the area. He wants to kind of rejuvenate, you know, like kind yeah. of really get everyone involved and, and, and feeling part of something. And the way he approached the Derby game recently against Scunthorpe was a, a big indicator of that. You know, you saw weeks before that game came along fans forum things were popping up on social media you know he's kind of bad mouthing Scunthorpe in a fans forum and you know we're getting big cheers from the fans in the you know the the audience and stuff like that and you kind of get clues there that you know he's going to build up this game massively against Scunthorpe it's a it's a a lower a bottom half of league two game in early March there's nothing at stake <laughs> but Grimsby turned up at, you know totally fired up there's a you know uh, sort of I won't I won't go over the board and say unsavoury things happen in the game, but it's a bit feisty, and and kind of Grimsby, you know, eked out a two 0 win in it in a really sort of scrappy, don't really care, you know, how they come across type manner, and it was you know the signs were there a couple of months before when Holloway came in that he was targeting that derby game as a way of getting the Grimsby fans on side. Yeah, I mean, mate, I think. It would be awesome if one day if we had the time to just go through every manager you've ever profiled and kind of get a good diagnosis and and, and, and also the teams too um, because I feel like you're someone you know that has a lot has a lot of research you've done over the years and kind of pick your mind mate but we'll um we'll try and finish it up a bit here Are you if I I'll give you a fun question mate if you if you were a manager who would you be 
since you've been able to diagnose yourself and give yourself a uh, personality type? I know what I'd like to be. Um, <laughs> I share. It's yeah. It's like you. You know. You become a bit of a fanboy of the like Pep Guardiola is the same personality type. So you kind of you, you use people as role models because and and that's one of the good things about on a personal development level when you understand your personality type and then you find out who the role models are even in business and things like that. You then know which autobiographies and things to gravitate towards you like to see how people who, are, who have the same type of wiring what they're doing to get the results they're getting and you know so mm. so for me reading you know um, books that have been sort of close behind the scenes with Pep Guardiola like Pep Com- Confidential have, have been inspiring books for me to read because I kind of I get the same logic and I get the you know the the kind of same way the functions work, which is you know every single every single type as the, there's brilliant examples of, of every single manager type you know uh, you know Brian Clough Sir Alex Ferguson Pep Guardiola Jurgen Klopp Maurizio Pochettino Carlo Ancelotti they're all different types you know it doesn't matter what they've, like the the there's no one single type that repeatedly keeps coming forward yeah. and becoming the most historically relevant managers or the most successful managers all completely different types um, and I think that's what's one of the one of the fantastic things about this in football is that football is such a universal sport it appeals to every single personality type if any personality type applies itself enough becomes a great footballer then the ones that study the game and you know the because if every if every manager was of the same type, or there was loads of the same type in in in, a, in the Premier League, then everyone would be playing the same way and going about things the same way. But in order to find a he- an edge and sort of outperform your budget or whatever it might be, you have to go and find somebody who's going to do things differently to the way everyone else and or the way other teams are doing it that you're competing with. So it will always it's just fertile ground to always have a diverse range of personality types. And do you, do you think you yourself will always be with the end goal of doing all this to implement it into betting? Or do you think since you've had, you know, you've been studying for years and years about this, that you'll be able to implement it into other facets of life? Yeah, well, I, I, it's something I'm going to continue on. I think I'm quite sure about that. Um, I'd love to get into football with it, I'll be quite honest. I, I'd, I'd love to be the guy that, you know, a club calls in and says, right, we've got a problem. We just sat the last manager. We're not really sure where to start on the next manager. And then I just help them problem solve it. They choose the manager that they want, but I'll give them answers to the questions that they want to ask and what was going wrong with the last guy and what problem do you want to solve? Well, you probably need managers who are more, or you, you might want to consider managers who are more like this type. Here's your list of options. Here's, so you know, and you can come up with some left field managers that you might never have thought about make everything make sense to them and then they make their own decision I'd love to do something like that yeah that'd be a great job wouldn't it mate yeah. um, plans plans for the future mate do you think can we can you give us the time limit on when you think you'll have all this um, studying done I guess profiling all these managers and then when you think you'll be done of how to implement that into into betting yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to be looking to implement it all the time. I'm going to be using Fox Punter as a kind of laboratory, I suppose, for sharing these examples um, as and when I'm going through them. You know, the statistical side of things is probably some uh, at the moment is, you know, it's a, I, I'll keep that side under wraps until, you know, you know what works and what doesn't. But yeah, I'll just be, I'll just be using it as like a laboratory to, you know, run these things through Fox Punter. But I am going to build a non-betting business around manager profile and think I think betting kind of limits the potential of the yeah the subject a lot so I, I'm I'm in the process of building a, a website and you know it might lead to courses or programs and things like that for people to learn this as a skill um, but ultimately yeah just that you know imaginary step by step for me is that the that, that the manager profiling business will will start up then that will probably lead into a book i mean you want to you want to you want to build your name or reputation up about something then i guess you've got to write a book on the subject and show that you know your subject inside out 
and then I'd love to get into football with it. I mean, that's the long game over two, three, four years. Things might materialise in the meantime that take me on a completely different path. But, but yeah, I love sharing this stuff. So it's like it is very much on the agenda to create, generate loads of free content, but also create a business out of that as well, where people who love the because some people won't like the technical side, you know, just want. Give, give me the gossip kind of thing and I'm more than happy to kind of share snippets of the way that I see things based putting this logic into you know in, yeah. in like fitting fitting scenarios as they unfold to the model um, and trying to make sense of situations that people can't necessarily make sense of immediately um, but then for those who do want the deeper dive then there would be products further down the line I imagine where I'd kind of teach the step by step of what I've gone through but specifically about football managers because I think another one on the step on the way was I just like to work with people who work in leadership roles um, with sports teams with all sorts of teams but if you I think a lot of people get thrust into kind of leadership positions in whatever industry they're in and they feel like they have to be a certain way um, to be successful in, in management and every personality type has its own way of doing things and if you try to copy somebody else's way of management it's you know football proves that any any way of managing a team could be successful and it's just about being true to yourself and understanding what your specific skills are based on the way you're wired and what you enjoy doing and kind of getting yourself into flow and becoming that person and being the best so you know the Americans say the best version of yourself but that's it it's you know so that would be one step after the book before getting into football would be leadership coaching and just you know general stuff I just I love the subject so any way that I can apply it it's exciting yeah yeah I think like I mean like I said I feel like we could talk about this for hours and I think it would be great to have you back on when the when the football's back up and running and you know delving deep like you said into actual situations or scenarios that are going on at the moment throughout the season with you know managers being sacked and or managers that are on the outer and I mean the most the example that I can think of the top of my head would be like a, a Jose Mourinho who seems like he's I mean he seems like he's uh he's struggling a little bit considering he normally the normal Jose Mourinho or at least the worst version of Jose Mourinho you can think of seems to get something out of the team he's with for the first two years maybe a little bit less but it seems like he might have already lost that and it's only been a couple of months. So, um, yeah, I think when, when football comes back on, it will be really cool to look into uh, certain situations that are going on in the EPL and in, um, in the championship also, mate. Um, what, what, uh, where can people find you, mate? And what, um, obviously you're on Twitter and stuff like that, but what I'd maybe explain a bit about Fox Punter and um, where people can get a hold of some of your... Uh, very intuitive stuff that you're coming up with at the moment. Yeah, well, foxpunter.com is the first port of call. Um, you know, basically, there's an ebook at the moment, free ebook, just eight mental models that will transform your football betting. It's, you know, quite a hooky title, but yeah, eight different mental models that I kind of use myself in, in, in different places and, you know, for different circumstances. Um, one of them being Myers Briggs profiling. And then once you're on the email list, there'll be you know there's other content that will follow up from that about elaborating more on the ebook, but also more going deeper into the manager profile and what I'll be doing over the next couple of years and how I'll be uh, approaching it and you know creating all kinds of different content. I suppose is is you know in time once the football starts up again. But yeah, foxpunter.com is the place. I'm at, at foxpunter on Twitter as well, but. I'm not as active on social media these days. I'm too busy transcribing manager interviews. So, <laughs> yeah, no, and, and a shout out to uh, Mark O'Hare who put me on to you and said that uh, you'd be a brilliant guy to have on the podcast. And um, yeah, he briefly described the managing profile thing to me that he said, "Don't ask me any more than what I've just said because I've got basically no idea about what he's up to." <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mark. Great guy as well. Great guy, Mark. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Great guy. Um, all right, cool, mate. Well, thanks for coming on once again. Um, in terms of what we got on the podcast next, um, not 100% sure yet, but we will be back uh, next Monday. And um, guys, thanks for listening once again. Please make sure you subscribe to the podcast, whether wherever that is, Apple, Spotify. Um, listen on YouTube too. Um, subscribe to YouTube on there. Um, and it would be really good if you guys could rate and review 
the podcast. That would be uh, superb. But also find Trade Mate Sports on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all these kind of places. But, uh, mate, thanks for, thanks for coming on once again, Mike. Yeah, pleasure, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Cool. All right. See you guys next week.